Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is my colleague here in the Department of Economics at George Mason University, Pete Betke. Pete, welcome back to Econ Talk. Welcome, Russ. Thanks. Our topic for today is Austrian economics, the Austrian school of economics. My goal is to give you, the listener, an overview of the Austrian school, and few are more qualified to do that than Pete. Pete, tell us about the origins of the Austrian school. Well, the Austrian school started... Uh, in the late 19th century, uh, as in a lot of cases in economics, the school label was given to them by their enemies, not by their, not, uh, they didn't self-identify themselves as Austrian economists. Karl Menger uh, wrote a book, uh, he was working as a financial journalist, um, and he wanted to sort of understand how you could explain prices and movements of prices, and He thought that the German language contributions to economics had underemphasized the sort of universal theoretical ideas that are essential for being able to interpret historical phenomena such as the movement of prices. And so he set out to write a book explaining how it is that prices emerge on markets. And he dedicated it, in fact, to the German historical school because he thought that he was, in fact, contributing to the great tradition of German language economics, which stood in somewhat juxtaposition to classical British economics. But he was trying to bring a kind of a non Ricardian. So, so the British economics had moved to a Ricardian tradition in which tended to underemphasize the human element and instead focus on the long run. Uh, cost side of things, uh, technology and resource scarcity, not the perceptions of the human agents. As Menger says in his book, man is the alpha and the omega of economics. And so he wanted to have man at the center of that, which meant that you had to deal with uh, sort of the specificity of various different institutions in which man finds himself acting but that there was some universal idea of means ends rationality that he wanted to do. But when you refer to the classical British school, you're talking about Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, correct? Right. Well, yeah, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, David Ricardo. And, and I think it was really the Ricardian tradition that he was trying to uh, – Trying to steer it back toward its origins back, right, from Smith. Yeah. But the German historical school was hostile to this classical British school. What was the German historical school's outlook? Well, they believed that, uh, one, that uh, the um, psychology that the classical economist imposed on um, man uh, was the wrong psychology. Um, So man wasn't so acquisitive. I mean, that was a cultural thing, whether or not you're acquisitive, self-interested, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, And then the classical schools thought that they had come up with universal laws, for human behavior. For human behavior. And the, class, and the German historicist argued that, no, the, the economics in 1820 Germany is different from the economics in 1650, uh, you know, Britain or whatever. And so they thought that you had to spend all your time specifying the um, specific culture, culture historical his, context, his institutions and whatnot. And what Menger wanted to do was – recognize that it's extremely important to to understand this institutional specificity, but the best way we understand behavior within institutions is to understand the universal and then meld it with the institution. So he thought he was adding to the great German tradition of economics. And they didn't agree. The younger version, the younger members of the German school, you know, said that's that Austrians, you know, the crazy Austrian school. And so as a result, Menger, right from the beginning, then was forced to send, try to say, defend theoretical social sciences. And that's what led to the Methodenstreit, which was the battle over methods in German language economics between the Austrian school and the German historical school. Um, that uh, came to define what it meant to be an Austrian. Austrians were deductivist. The what German. Does that, what uh, does that mean? They believed that you could uh, um, 
you know, deduce the principles of economics through uh, reflection on the individual choice problem. Whereas the German historical school, like the institutional school in America, was all focused on the institutions and the specificity at the time, and they were inductivists. The laws, the the understanding of economics was through observation, not through theoretical investigation. And so the schools sort of uh, battled with one another, and the way in which uh, economics sort of resolved that, um, at least up until <clears throat> like the mid twentieth century was to try to mix, you know, both of them in some sense. But. Which, which is really what a lot of economists still do today, that mixing of institutional context with individual choice and how that context affects the choice. But going back to the, the Austrian school itself, Menger was, was really the uh, forerunner, the, right. or, or the pioneer, whatever you call it, the, the, uh, the, the grandparent. Uh, who are some of the economists who came after him influenced by his way of thinking that we associate with the Austrian school? Well, uh, Menger's immediate uh, uh, influences were felt in, in uh, Eugen von, von Wurk and uh, Friedrich Wieser, um, who uh, were also located at the University of Vienna. But um, uh, Menger had a, a very wide influence as a um, thinker across the continent. And so uh, Nut Fixell and, and uh, the Swedish economist and um, several uh, Italians and there was a Polish-Austrian school. And um, there were several people who, who – because Menger was also one of the co-founders of the Marginalist Revolution. So along with uh, uh, Jevons and Valras, he is, uh, you know, one of the three co-founders of the idea of, of uh, margin utility, uh, the application of margin utility. And Menger was a marginalist and a subjectivist. You could argue that the other traditions were more marginalist and less subjectivist, um, but it was this marginalist subjectivist revolution which overturned the way in which classical economics had described uh, the the nature of, of uh, individual uh, behavior in the laws of economics. Now, we're in the late 19th century right now yeah. in this conversation when we're talking about Balra and, and Menger and the influence of this idea of marginalism. So I want to try to make that a little clearer. The, the most – correct me if I'm wrong – the most influential economist shortly after that who embraced that would be Marshall, it would right, seem to yeah. me, who in his principles of economics – took this idea of marginalism, which we're going to try to make clear in a sec, uh, really to its, uh, to its peak at the time. Uh, and then following in, in his footsteps, the mathematical revolution of the mid-20th century of Hicks and Samuelson that, that followed after that. But let, let's, um, let's try to give our listeners a, a better understanding of what we mean by marginalism and marginal utility, uh, a concept that I, I find tricky to, to explain to students. Take a crack at it. Yeah. Uh, well, first thing is more. We, uh, we we breathe it in. It, 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 once you go to graduate school in, in modern times, um, you're essentially a marginalist, and, and um, you emphasize things quote at the margin. It's a phrase that we use and drop in conversation and in analysis uh, because we understand it, but it's a little trickier, I think, for for a newcomer. Yeah. The um, Marshall's phrase is "history doesn't move in giant leaps." Right, it's some little small incremental steps, and uh, basically the idea is that the uh, individual, when choosing, weighs the next alternative rather than the idea of all uh, the alternatives that are in front of him. And so, uh, the classic uh, paradox on this was: Why is it that diamonds are more valuable than water when water is essential for human survival? One of the and diamonds are are not are totally. Seemingly unimportant and right. yet are very expensive. And so, you know, one of the really bad movies from the 1970s is a movie called Ice Pirates. I you missed can, that one. Pete. You <laughs> Sorry, see, but in the in the premise of the movie in Ice Pirates is that ice becomes the most valuable commu uh, commodity in all of the universe because water is extremely scarce, and they carry it in little ice cubes. And so the pirates run around, and it's a it's a very bad movie, but uh, <laughs> it makes this economics point that if all of us sudden water became uh, very scarce, we would uh, value it at uh, extremely high uh, prices in our, uh, in our, in our economic behavior. Um, but because it's relatively abundant at the moment, diamonds are relatively scarce. Diamonds are more valuable than, than water. And that was sort of the main um, 
idea that uh, the economists who were emphasizing the marginal choice were uh, pointing out this idea that we never choose between all the water in the world and all the diamonds in the world, but always the choice on the next available unit. And they use that to explain down the line the way in which you would sort of value different things. So um, you know, you, all your choices are always choices on the margin. For example, if, if water becomes relatively scarce, uh, you might end up like, for example, when we have, uh, you know, long times like we experienced here in, in Northern Virginia this past summer where we didn't have rain for a very long time, uh, you know, people will have dirtier cars, uh, their lawns will be, uh, you know, Brown, browner and yeah. these kind of things. And so it was, uh, trying to explain that aspect of human behavior, which led to the emphasis on the margin. Yeah, l- let me go back to the water diamond thing and try to say it in a, maybe a slightly different way. Uh, the first units of water that we consume are extremely valuable. We would pay enormous amounts because they sustain life. As we get more and more, the extra amounts, that's what is usually meant by marginal, the extra amounts aren't worth as much. So when we're talking about water being cheap, we're talking about the next bit of water, which is used maybe to water a lawn or to let the faucet run while we're brushing our teeth, and that, that convenience rather than turning it in on and off in the morning, that's not worth very much. And that's what sets the price rather than the earlier amounts right. of water, the first units that we might consume. And a, a, a consequence of that or a, what follows from that is that water is extremely valuable. It's just that the units that we are consuming right now, the Extra units, given that we've consumed so much, are not that valuable. Um, and this comes into play for, for students of economics in supply and demand analysis, say, where you know, if, if supply shifts and crosses demand, if supply shifts in and crosses demand, as you're saying, during a mm-hmm. drought, uh, you might – water might become very valuable, although it's not always priced in a, in a market – rarely right. is priced in a market setting by, by municipalities – but water might become very valuable, whereas if if, it, if supply shifts, water will become cheaper. And those price shifts are statements about how much people value the next little bit of water, not mm-hmm. water per se. Right. And that's um, that's not an intuitive way for students to think, <laughs> in my experience, it. or for people when trying to decide public policy. Um, and I think that's a major major contribution of economics. So l- let's go back to our. Um, so you can see how Menger, who's trying to explain how real prices emerge in financial markets, mm-hmm. is then going to sort of want, uh, he, you know his focus, his primary focus, was already out the window. The existence of an array of prices and the way they move in the real world, and he was trying to find the economic way to make sense out of those price movements. And so he found the emphasis on uh, this this marginal aspect to be important, but what differentiated Menger from Valras and Jevons, and thus later Marshall, was uh, his complete and, and uh, embracement of subjectivism, that all economic phenomena work through the filter of the human mind. And so in a recent podcast, you had uh, Tyler Cowen on, and he mentioned about in his Discover the Inner Economist how he's reconnected with this this aspect of his roots, his own intellectual roots, in the emphasis on the, it's not just a matter of the incentives to grasp opportunities, but also the perception that individuals have of those opportunities of which they then grasp. And so it's this focus on what you know people later refer to as subjective value the idea that a uh, um you know, a, let's imagine two paintings, a Pete and a Picasso. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, and, and at some level we both uh, sort of scribble, you know, on here or whatever, but people value a Picasso much higher than a Pete, even though the the characteristics, the inherent characteristics of the good are, are, are almost identical or could be almost identical. Yeah, you know, really, these two issues of subjectivism and marginalism come into play in daily conversation when people complain that, athletes are paid so much compared to school teachers or firefighters. So one reason the athletes make so much more is, of course, at the margin, meaning given the current scarcity of people able to hit a 95-mile-an-hour fastball relative to the number of people capable of standing in front of a classroom, uh, they're going to be paid more. But the other reason is this subjective reason. Because we value that. Is that ev- people evidently really, really, really like watching sports, even though you could make an argument from some first principles that it's, quote, not important. Right. The, the the subjective of school says that's irrelevant. I um, 
I often use the example in class of curling, the the uh-huh. Olympic sport, in which they have the they, sh- the, you know, throw the the stone down the ice, yes. and a guy's a, a a broom sweeper or whatever. Right. And I always say at the Olympic level, the person who's sweeping is the best sweeper in the yeah. world. Yeah. But we don't really <laughs> watch that that much, and as a result, that person might have the skills of Michael Jordan, but he doesn't in have the sport, rates yeah. or doesn't have the rates of return. Yes. That yes. Michael Jordan That's does for his point. his unique talents, That's and a great if point. and if we change the perception. Of uh, you know certain things, and it's and this is again an, uh, like an Austrian point about um, why the supply curve is really the alternative demands for the sca- for the use of that scarce resource, rather than the idea of the cost of production of the demand curve. So the reason why doctors are uh, have um, uh, are expensive for us to go see specialists, for example, is not because they went to school for so many right. years and it, it took so long to produce a doctor and all that stuff. It, it's actually because we are in the waiting room. Right. If we weren't in the waiting room, the doctor couldn't charge that price. So it's the alternative demands for that service, which rep- reflect the supply curve. And then the demand curve, you know, sloping down is the perceptions on the margin of the value of, the value. of that particular unit. Yeah, I was like, it, I, I, it's always worth repeating and emphasizing that this confusion that people have about what sets price, there's such a presumption that it's cost. Right. And, uh, or or something else. The example I like to use is the you go into the shoe store in the mall and the shoes that were a hundred dollars yesterday are three hundred, and you ask the manager why they're so expensive. He says, "Well, my daughter's getting married in a few months. I need I need to make some more money," right. and that just doesn't cut it right. in the marketplace because the subjective value that people place on those shoes hasn't changed. Nothing else has changed. And similarly, if the owner had said, "Oh well, you know, my cost just skyrocketed. This mall raised my fees." You'd, you'd shop at a different shop. You right. wouldn't say, well, if your costs are higher, I have to pay right. more. So in common language, we use those justifications all the time as if they're explanatory. They're, they're not. Yeah. And, and that's really a contribution of the – of the both the subjective school and the marginal. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think school. good economics. You know, good economics is good economics, and good economics is going to focus on this issue of the choice on the margin and the perceptions that individuals have and the valuation of goods. And and we take we, those as given. We don't yeah, argue and, with and, people. And there are so many times in which people in the common language sneak in these ideas that somehow there's an objective criteria of what's highly valued and what's low. You know, and and uh, as you mentioned with the school school teachers uh, issue and, and sports athletes, you know, the idea that is similar to the water diamond paradox. Yeah. How can we as a society, yeah, what's wrong? Our kids are so valuable to us. Why don't we pay these teachers more money? And, um, and being my self interest, my wife's a public school teacher. So, uh, and, uh, um, but it's because on the margin, you know, the individuals who can do that. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that was, uh, I mean, that, so you can see if you think about it, if you get technical for a second, that's the relationship between the Ricardians and the Austrians because the Ricardians tended to bring costs back in. So you think about the way Marshall is trying to develop that uh, tradition, the sort of, and what does he do? He says both blades are yeah. the scissors. What the Austrians... By, re- by that he meant supply and demand, right, demand and, co- and supply, not and just cost, but subjective also Subjective evaluations yeah. influence the demand curve, cost of production determine the supply curve. Right. And the way the Austrians responded to that wasn't to say, oh, there's no supply and demand curve. What they said was, yes, of course, both blades of the scissors cut the paper, but both the blades are made of the same stuff, which is the subjective evaluations of individuals. Now, I was a graduate student, as you know, at the University of Chicago, and this was in the 70s. And when I think of the Austrian school, what I learned as a budding economist uh, in the 70s was that the Austrians – didn't believe in mathematics and they didn't believe – they didn't believe in theory because they didn't believe in mathematics and they didn't believe in measurement because they didn't believe in econometrics. So talk a little bit – by the way, I've come to uh, question both of those cr- criticisms uh, and uh, – our colleague Don Boudreau likes to likes to say that I'm somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean or uh, in between uh, <laughs> yeah. Vienna and Chicago. I actually think I'm more on the somewhere in the middle of France. I, I find myself drifting closer and closer to the Austrian school, such that I I'm, I'm something of an Austrian now. Um, but th- that view that that Austrian economics is anti mathematics, anti theory, anti measurement. Uh, is that true? And tell me uh, – give me what, what really does typify the modern Austrian schools. We've been talking about Menger. Let's move to the, the economists that uh, followed Menger, Mises, Hayek, and others 
who um, who are still worth reading. Uh, most people don't read Menger with profit unless they're historians of economic thought, but Mises and Hayek and others are still uh, well-read. Talk about what distinguished their work as uh, Austrians. Well, <clears throat> I mean, it's a very complicated question the relationship between mathematics and economics and the relationship of statistics and economic history um, and and what the Austrians propositions were about those things it's uh, it's an easy thing to say that they didn't write in math and they didn't use statistics and so therefore they must not be either competent in those areas or, or they're uh, hostile to them or they're you know hostile to them um, the reality is is that many of the the individuals especially in the modern Austrian school were in fact trained uh, as engineers and 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 whatnot they just didn't see the applicability uh, of those uh, uh, ideas to the certain ideas that they were talking about. Hayek uh, uh, constantly is saying it's not so much that the mathematics approach is wrong, it's that the mathematics of uh, you know Newtonian math uh, you know um, uh, physics, which is the mathematics that was used by economists, is not uh, appropriate mathematics for the complexity of the social world. So you would need a more uh, complex uh, set of mathematical tools, which you know some people could argue nowadays are being developed in the field of uh, complex yeah. complexity and and whatnot, or and we, com, com, um, complex adaptive systems. We've talked about that here. Here were uh, in, in some recent podcasts the um, this contrast between a biological model right. and a physics model. Uh, an idea in physics, physics very mechanistic, uh, as practiced by in, in by most phys physicists. Obviously, right. there's a non mechanistic, chaotic form of physics also that's become more important in the last few decades. But phys Newtonian physics is very mechanical and described by basically linear systems. Economists adopted that um, methodology, influenced, I think, mostly by Samuelson right. uh, in the middle of the 20th century, and that, that the economy could be modeled the way uh, the solar system could be yeah. as a set of equations, et cetera. And it reached its height in, in certain econometric models of the, of the economy as a whole. And well, I Kenneth, think Kenneth Bolding just uh, you know he he, he you know, Kenneth Bolding used to have a line. He was the John Bates Clark Award winner, uh, one of the early ones. Uh, that's, and that's the award that goes to the best economist under the age of forty. Right, and Bolding uh, um, given every other year. Who who uh, turned around and he said um, he he also didn't use much mathematics later on in his career and he said uh, economists use 17th century math to solve 21st century problems and they call me backwards uh -huh. and uh, and I think that that's sort of the Hayekian line Mises's line was a little um, slightly different his argument uh, follows actually from our earlier conversation was that mathematics was applied wrong I mean it was a, it was a wrong application because in order to make a concept like, for example, margin utility, they would have some concept of total utility in which they would take the first derivative. So as you know, in the development of mathematical economics, margin utility eventually got pushed out of the side. That's what's Hick's big thing. You know, we get marginal rates of substitution rather than, than uh, you know, margin utility. And Mises says, no, that's a misunderstanding of the concept of margin utility. It's, we never had a concept of total utility in which we take a first derivative of. No, that's the calculus understanding of the concept concept on the margin. What what the Austrians mean is this issue of these discrete units, right, in which you have these different bundles like what we were talking about before. And as a result, then the development of calculus to that way of thinking is simply a wrong application of mathematics. It forces a set of continuity on a lumpy world, which in fact uh, isn't doesn't hold. And so Mises rejected the mathematical method um, from a, a very, you know, sort of um, uh, sort of analytical stance, not uh, not from any you know disrespect for it or whatever. He just argued it was the wrong uh, tool to use for the task that you were trying to get at. Yeah, well, let me let me give our re our listeners some background here. When we talk about utility and marginal utility, utility is the abstract concept that economists use to describe something that's hard to describe: satisfaction, pleasure, happiness, etc. And when we talk about the total utility we get from water or from shirts, or from uh, watching a baseball game, we're, we're trying to describe something that is 
fundamentally subjective that we're treating as if it were quantifiable. Right. And marginal utility means the extra pleasure, the extra happiness, the extra satisfaction. In the early days of economics, people were hoping that this would be literally measurable, that we could somehow get a metric uh, that would allow us to talk about a person's happiness level or a person's satisfaction level. And the early uh, utilitarians talked about utils uh, as, the, as, the, as the unit of utility. Uh, economists gave up on that. For, for after a while, which is what we're talking about, yeah. uh, and said it doesn't matter that you can't measure it because all that it matters is relative happiness, and we can look at people's actions and see what they prefer. But of course, we're coming back to it a little bit with in neuroeconomics the well, and the happiness tr- and the happiness literature trying to actually quantify this. Whether that turns out to be a um, fool's errand or not, I think remains to be seen. But let's go. B- let's come back to the. Um, to the main proponents of Austrianism. I've gotten us off on a little bit of a sidetrack. What distinguishes the Austrian school? What are the tenets uh, of the Austrian school that that you see as the most important in distinguishing it from uh, uh, other forms of economic ways of thinking or just that that give it its flavor? Well, just to make a real quick brief statement about, you know, when you were mentioning about University of Chicago and your own intellectual development, I think it's important to stress that in the Austrian uh, tradition, um, all of the uh, major thinkers derived inspiration from a variety of different thinkers outside of the Austrian school. So uh, Hayek is, is very much influenced by Menger and Wieser and Mises, but he also is extremely influenced by Hume and Smith and a variety of people. So it's kind of you know, strange. It's not a doctrinaire kind of, of approach. Uh, modern Austrians, as I like to point out, are as influenced by Armin Alchin and Leland Jaeger and uh, Axel Leyenhofer, all these guys, Coase, uh, Demsets, Demsets uh, uh, Oliver Williamson, a variety of different thinkers um, across the board. So the idea that there's somehow a doctrinaire a straightforward Austrian school in which you read, you know, Menger, and then you read Von Bavrik, and then you read Mises, and then you read Hayek, and then you're able to go out into the world. It's it's kind of a, um, you know, not not. It's a caricature. It's not yeah. the correct picture. Now the question is, what is it in this soup of economists that uh, is common among them? And I would argue that the main, uh, you you know, I I have this piece in David Henderson's new Concise Encyclopedia of Economics, and I. That's coming out very shortly from Liberty Fund. Right, and it's I a list wonderful book. I list ten propositions in there, but I'll just pick just a few of them. I'm going to just pick three right now, which okay. I think are fairly main. One is that the Austrians are methodological individualists. All of those economists that I mentioned before, that's a common characteristic among them. Harold Demsetz is a methodological individualist as well. This doesn't mean a methodological atomist. It just means that the um the, the the what you focus on in any economic explanation is the individual and their choices that that is the beginning of the things it's not societies don't choose or anything like that it's not to deny collective entities that there is such a thing as the united states but in understanding for example the united states decision to enter a military conflict the uh, it would be we didn't we didn't decide. we didn't decide the individual decision makers made those decisions they faced certain incentives they utilized certain information you know to make sense and they to understand to, they were in conflict and in right. competition with each other some people right. had more power than other people in making that decision or more influence right. but uh, I, I should say by the way that this 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 seems like a uh, a petty. Uh, um, criticism mm-hmm. uh, to say that that we're going to focus on individuals deciding, but other you know societies don't decide. That that sounds kind of like, well, of course societies don't decide. Individuals have to actually make the decisions. But I think that that insight, which um, which seems like just like a methodological uh, fine point, uh-huh. is extremely important, and, and I I can't emphasize enough how much it's affected me in the last uh, three or four years since coming here to George Mason, how much I think about things in, in that individualistic perspective, well, which, again, it sounds like, oh, it's just it's just methodology. It's not methodology. It, it fund, Holding individuals as being the decision makers and making the choices as opposed to collective entities making decisions is a fundamental way of looking at the world, and it's constantly um, – 
challenged by by mainstream culture, the media, the media, and and our our normal way of thinking is to say we chose, uh, society decided. Uh, the Congress decided. Congress doesn't decide. Right. There's no entity called Congress that makes a decision. There is a bunch of Congress, re- bunch of and representatives, in in the in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. They operate, as you say, in an institutional context, and decisions emerge from that stew. And to focus on uh, as if Congress had a will, or the people have a will that's being carried out by a leader, is an incredibly destructive um, and unhelpful way of thinking, even though it sounds like, oh, it's just shorthand. Right. And, and sometimes we fall into that shorthand, but I would argue that that really confuses what is fundamentally going on in the world. And when you have that individualistic focus, you really get a different perspective. Let me give you two examples, one from your educational time frame and one from today, which is a resurrection of the, or of the world and at the time you were being educated at University of Chicago. So what made University of Chicago unique and special in the 1970s before the rational expectations revolution dominated economics was that the University of Chicago actually emphasized micro-foundations, yeah. whereas other schools of economics at that time did think that the way that you studied the macroeconomy was relationship between aggregates that had no connection to the individuals that make up those aggregates. You could just abstract from that, right. and it's could, more effective. Would be and, the and and you think a lot of times we think that uh, okay, well we've you know defeated that sort of old Keynesian uh, way to do uh, social science, but actually you know it, it's embedded in our culture in the way when we talk about. Uh, you know, GDP and all the different things. We have Keynesian questions generated, Keynesian data in which we could get Keynesian policies. We have changed Keynesian analytical apparatus to a more micro foundations, but we still talk about aggregate data that is made up from the Keynesian period to do what? Basically Keynesian policies. Think about the world that we're confronted with today when we're talking about dealing with the difficulties of our modern economy. And and we still do think in terms of those kind of um, controlling of the aggregate variables. Right, as if and, they were under somewhat, as if those were choice variables. Yeah, and so, and so George Akerlof just has a new piece out in which he says, we have to come to grips with the fact that the most important macro relationship is the Phillips curve. Right and 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 and, and, and explain what that is for the for trade-off reasons. between inflation and unemployment is if the, that the policymakers could do this kind of trade-off at as if they have the levers right and in fact we instantiated that in our in our uh, United States public policies with the uh, Humphrey uh, well, the Humphrey Hawkins yeah. bill right which to maintain sort of uh, high levels of of employment. And, and this idea that we could do these sort of stable trade-offs without any reference to the individual incentives that are made up in the labor market or in the, uh, financial, the market. financial markets or whatever. And so it's very hard for us to come to grips completely with the methodological individualist uh, implications of uh, micro foundations. And, uh, and I think that the Austrians in that regard um, – you know, Mises and Hayek. Hayek ha- had a, uh, 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 was very much involved in these debates with Keynes. And uh, he argued from the beginning that Keynes's aggregate approach would mask the underlying causal reasons for unemployment and the disruptions in the economy. And um, I'm not so sure that we fully come to grips with his position on that. Um, and, uh, you know, we might be seeing uh, the playing out of that again in, in the way that we've uh, tried to fine tune the economy over the last 20 years to have soft landings with any kind of recessions and the bills might be coming home. We have, we have two competing hypotheses, which is either that um, central bankers have perfected the task of central banking over the last 20, uh, 30 years, and as a result, they've been able to figure out uh, how to how to do this uh, so that we can minimize the distortions of credit expansion or easy money, or uh, we've just been uh, push you know pushing off into the future a more uh, uh, drastic adjustment process, which we are in fact now confronted with um, in, in our own economy. I mean, I think that this will be. Um, a situation that will be played out over the next 
year or so that we'll yeah, I'm, see. I'm not sympathetic to that particular concern. I, I don't think we're standing over the edge of an abyss um, due to past uh, decisions that, that ignored some of these effects. And I'm sympathetic to the view that central banking has become more effective. Um, I think your podcast with Milton Friedman and the emphasis that he put on Don Brash – and and the and, and and you know the um was is is right. I mean, it's true that that uh, Don Brash so, is the New Zealand uh, and the issue of inflation banker. targeting was extremely important. The question is whether or not the practice under Greenspan uh, was actually consistent with the way that that uh, Brash engaged in monetary yeah, no. policy. It's, it's, it's I mean, it's a it's a very difficult issue. Uh, I think to sort out, we have to recognize that the traditional Hayekian sort of explanation. Um, always is always has the claws holding other things constant, right. and the world has been changing quite drastically. I, I like to view it as a horse race between three S's, uh, what I'll call uh, Smithian gains from trade, the Smith horse running ahead, the Schumpeterian gains from innovation, uh, the Schumpeterian horse, and then the third horse is government stupidity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if stupidity outpaces Smith and Schumpeter, then we're in trouble. But as long as Smith and Schumpeter are slightly nose ahead of government stupidity, it doesn't deny that we'll have oscillations against a trend, that is booms and busts. But tomorrow's trough will be higher than today's peak because the Smithian gains from trade and the Schumpeter gains from innovation have pushed the uh, to, you know uh, pro productive the possibilities will, the, further. The yeah. peak will be higher than the trough. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that sort of the standard argument that I have of why I'm still an optimist about the American economy and its future is, but I don't deny that there has been a lot of mistakes in policy that have been uh, that have caused oscillations against the trend. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, we don't want to. I mean, we might not I, I don't want to go down there. I, I don't want to go down that path because yeah. I don't. We'll save it for another time talking yeah. about the macro issues. I want to stick with this methodological issue. I, I think this this um, and philosophical issue. I think this idea that individuals choose rather than nations or Congress or uh, various uh, collective entities. I think you know the the collective entity choice idea is so seductive. Uh, you know, I think the people who use it. Justify it on two grounds. One is, well, it's close enough, mm -hmm. uh, is one argument they make. And the second argument they make is, I, they don't make an argument, but I think the appeal of it is so powerful. The idea that, that we as a group make this choice as, as a collective, as a community, it is very appealing. And I just think it's methodologically dangerous, uh, both in how you perceive reality and, and, the, and the welfare implications of it. And when, when I think of these macro issues, I think of things like the trade deficit or right. the level of inequality, issues that People just sort of presume we've chosen. We've right. chosen to tolerate this level of inequality as if we could move it around uh, either with little cost or no cost or even with big cost when, right. in fact, it may not be movable. Right. It may not be – we might as a group – there are very few things we could do as a body politic to perhaps change that I, without yeah. radically re, uh, changing the system that, that, that produces it. And the idea that the level of inequality emerges from the, level, the choices that thousands of individuals make uh, is, a, is not intuitive to most people. It's, they, everyone most people, I think, presume that, that we've, you know, we've decided to give the rich more if their share goes up, and that's simply not true. When I, uh, I taught at New York University for um, roughly 10 years, and when I was up there, I taught a course. It was a very interesting course. It was for freshmen who had declared that they wanted to get a PhD in economics. Now, that's not like uh, <laughs> you know pre-med or pre-law students. It's a very unusual yeah, group uh, to do that. But they needed to have 1,500 or higher on the old SATs to get into the class. So they were extremely bright students, very, very uh, uh, capable. And I taught um, the the principles, their first course that they would take in the in the class, and I made them read three books: um, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, uh, Alfred Marshall's Principles of Economics, and Joe Stiglitz's Principles of Economics. And the idea was to show the continuity and discontinuities in the history of modern of of the development of economics over time. And uh, what was fascinating with that's, this – That's sort of beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. Uh, as one of, could argue. Yeah, of the way that uh, – that, that, that The current end at least. The current end, yeah. 
And uh, well, Stiglitz's book was being championed as the next Samuelson. If, if this is in the early '90s when it came out. And um, but anyway, the um, the one continuity was a concern of poverty. The claim that economists don't care about poverty right. is ludicrous because it's been the core of what economists have thought about. When Adam Smith asked this question, it's an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. What he was worried about was the move from uh, you know, extreme poverty into opulence. How is it that countries do it? Why is it that some countries are able to do it and other countries are unable to do it? Um, and Marshall was worried very much about the distribution aspects and, of course, Stiglitz you know, very much has to do it. The difference is the means by which they thought you could alleviate the problem of poverty. Uh, in, I, for, in rough terms, the way that Adam Smith believed that you alleviated poverty was to get your economy growing. In which, you know, like the basic Milton Friedman point that all ships rise in a rising tide. So the idea was to get your economy growing and going up here. Uh, by the time we get to Stiglitz, it's an issue of democratic choice. But the problem is, is that um, right, the war on poverty. As yes, if we it's a, it's as just, a, na a nation would would uh, marshal our resources as if we were off to war to s defeat the scourge. Right, and we could reallocate, you know, any way we want it. And the problem, as Buchanan has pointed, Jim Buchanan has pointed out in his work, is that policy is never a choice between particular distributions, but instead always a choice over the rules, which engender a pattern of exchange, production, and thus distribution. And so um, another way to put this is that we could fix unequal endowments, but we've never figured, you know, by just simply taking from some and giving to others, but we've never figured out a way to do it that doesn't impact the incentives of the, of the, of the choosers. And so that we don't leave the incentive system neutral with respect to the way that we divide up the pie. And that creates all kinds of problems in these discussions of uh, notions of what we mean by fair division and whatnot. And I, I you know, again, I think this is an, an area where good economics, not n any hyphenated economics, just good economics, um, would have to emphasize the individual choice problem that they face, the perceptions that those individuals have in making their choices, the knowledge that they have to acquire in order to be able to make uh, a choice, you, you know. Um, well, and these are the kind of, of uh, aspects which people like Hayek and Mises have emphasized. Well, let me stick with that example because it's one I, I just make a very simple point here. Uh, some people in favor of um, – who are worried about the current level of the distribution of income, worried about the current level of inequality, worried about the share of the top 1 percent, worried about um, opportunities for mobility, et cetera, have suggested, say, as you say, you have to have a policy. You can't just um, uh, move income around as if it were um, – pieces on a chessboard, to right. choose an Adam Smith uh, analogy, a metaphor. And they say, well, let's have higher taxes. Now, it would seem obvious that higher taxes on the rich would reduce the inequality in the economy. One thing people never, ever talk about is that higher taxes are going to change the return to the skills of people who are currently getting higher than average incomes. And simple economics predicts that when you tax something, uh, the pre-tax level goes up, and that's going to mitigate any effects, Not maybe not eliminate it, although it could, but it's going to mitigate your apparent impact on the distribution of income. And of course, it's going to set in motion a thousand other, th other things. Uh, to pick a person, I don't know whether you consider him an Austrianish person, but Thomas Sowell, Thomas Sowell likes to point out when you propose a policy, and then what? Yeah. That's essential for him. That's the essence of the economic way of thinking. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, if we raise taxes on the rich and give money to the poor, that's going to reduce inequality. Uh, so I would say, well, well, at first, and then what? What are the incentives yeah. that are going to be put in place to, to make that change? Well, we've gone to answer to answer your question. Thomas yeah. Sowell's knowledge and decisions is very Austrian one of book. the yeah. one of the <laughs> you know really great you know books in applied Austrian economics, the way to think about it, the way to frame questions in that regard. It's very high accurate. And, and I think it's important because to, as, to follow up on the line that you just gave, think about uh, us as economists trying to understand, do the right thing. You know, well, there's two questions that have to be asked when we ask what is doing the right thing. The first one is why, 
right? This is the basic economics. Why? What is the incentives and motivation for us to do the right thing? What, you know, what, are we incentive compatible for us to do that? But even assuming away and assuming that we want to do the right thing, we have to somehow find out what the right thing to do is. We have to get that knowledge. And the various different systems generate that knowledge. And I think in uh, Soul's book, Knowledge and Decisions, he probably brings that fine point into focus more than any other book. Um, you know that's been written uh, that, that has a focus on not on on actual real world policy examples. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now I, I we went off on a little bit of yeah. a, of a side note there. You may give your first proposition, which was individuals choose, uh, and that should be the focus of our analysis. Yeah. Well, give me t- give me your next proposition. I have two more. The the first one was is subjectivism, and uh, the idea that uh, oh, the facts of the social sciences are what people believe them to be rather than the idea that these facts are sort of outside of individuals. Um, what the, does that mean? Okay, I find that so, a very strange comment. So <laughs> the, <laughs> what the, uh, the example that is used in the classic uh, example of the contrast between the way that the Austrians view the task of the social scientists and the sort of objective and behavior-oriented tasks that others pick is Hayek uh, and Mises use the example of a Martian looking at uh, Grand Central Station. So a Martian who has no concept of human understanding or purposes or plans is just looking at boxes, subway trains in our mm-hmm. language, and bodies, humans, right. and a little hand on the clock – and, he, and, and, and the Martian, with his great, you know, uh, uh, observing uh, tools, looks down on the earth and sees that at 8 o'clock, uh, 8, when the hand is on the 8, uh, these bo- boxes move into the station and spit out a bunch of bodies. And they go scrambling around like crazy. And then uh, at notices at 5, the bodies come scrambling. They get swallowed back up by the boxes. Mm-hmm. And then they go away. And so he could observe this every day for you know months and then come up with very strict predictions about moving bodies in boxes, right? And he'd be pretty and, accurate. And he'd be pretty accurate. And, and we would say, ah, oh, see, he has predictive science or whatever. And what Hayek and Mises pointed out was that really doesn't get at what's going on in, in Grand Central Station. And what our task is, going back to the individual choice problem, is we need to understand what it is that's you know behind those choices and what's going on and so we need to get at the understanding that it's you know the commuting problem to work and and you know what the plans and purposes are so by objective facts you mean the 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 spitting out and and collecting in of the bodies even though those are facts those are not the interesting or relevant facts they're not the relevant facts is the is the right phrase let me challenge that because i I find that but notice how that relates to the macro issue too yes because it's 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 and so hayek says at one point in the counter-revolution of science which is a wonderful book that liberty fund uh you know publishes um he has a line in there where he says um that if we were talking about statistical aggregates and economics we somehow get confused but let's change it instead talk about statistical aggregates in language. So for example, I read a novel and rather than understanding the the you know purposes behind the novel and the characters and whatnot, what I do is I add up all the number of sentences and say, you know, Russ Roberts who wrote a wonderful novel, you know, on the uh, uh, you know on the Invisible Heart, uh, you know, he used on average uh, you know 250 words per paragraph or something like that, and that's what we talked about. Right. You know, that 250- would strip that would strip the essence yes. out of even though it would appear to be factual scientific. Scientific. and scientific because i could measure it i could actually have a model which predicted how many words you would use per paragraph and then i could like test it against the number of pages and i could say oh look aren't i a scientist and i've really scientifically analyzed Captured, now yeah. yeah but uh, i want to go back to that grand central station <laughs> thing because I, I, I i'm fascinated by that because it brings to uh it's a nice example for capturing what's troublesome to me or seems troublesome to me as a Chicago-trained uh, Austrian, um, um, newly minted Austrian. You and Deirdre McCloskey. Yeah. Well, there's a few of us. There aren't many. But um, here, here's, the, here's the thing that's strange about that. Because, and I want, I, I want to make sure we have time for your third proposition because I'm surprised that's your second one. But, I, but it's such an interesting example. Um, Friedman – uh, wrote a very influential methodological article, uh, which you'll remember the name of. Yeah. What is it? It's an essay on positive economics. Yeah, yeah. So 
Friedman basically argued, look, realism is overrated. Uh, what's important is prediction. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though the assumptions of economics are unrealistic, they have to be because we have to abstract from every notion of reality. I don't really need – even though it might matter what time the seller got up this morning mm -hmm. and whether he got a good night's sleep and that could affect his pricing, I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to abstract from all that. Even though he might bear a grudge against this particular bar, I'm going to assume that he acts in his own self-interest and he really wants to make as much. He's a profit maximizer, whatever the set of assumptions is. We make a set of, quote, unrealistic assumptions about rationality and about information sometimes, and that's uh, what we do to get our, our predictive power. Now, the Austrians come along, it seems to me, and one of their complaints, which, which I find um, unconvincing – Mm -hmm. is they say, well, that's not realistic. Now, it's not realistic. As, as, and, and when we go to the Grand Central Station thing, though, the problem I have is, true, the Martian analysis is unrealistic. True, the Martian analysis is, has stripped out what is potentially powerful and useful because there may be a day when there is um, – uh, well, take an obvious example. There's a holiday, holiday. And, the and, and the Martian gets, can't understand. He right. predicts at 8 o'clock all the trains are full, and yet they're empty. So obviously understanding what a holiday is and how work would matter in your predictive policy. But, but let me try to hone this criticism a little better. I'm rambling. Apologize. Um, to some extent, w what I think makes Hayek and Mises so fascinating is their understanding that order – emerges from uh, no one's intention. And I know that's one of your propositions. I don't know if that was going to be number three, but, but I'd like to talk about that. Adam Ferguson, predecessor to Adam Smith, said – talked about institutions that were the product of human action but not human design. And this, for me, along with the first proposition about individuals deciding, is what I find so fascinating and useful in thinking in an Austrian way, the idea that what appears to be a pattern mm -hmm. uh, that must be decided by someone that the train should be crowded at 8 and crowded at 5 and relatively quiet in between yeah. is not decided right. by anyone. It is the result of thousands of individuals making these – these two propositions, of course, interact at this point about individual decisions. No one has made the decision that the, that the train should be crowded at 8 and crowded at 5 and less crowded in the middle. But we as social scientists – exploit that. We're not Martians. True, we understand some of the underlying reasons, but we are often find it useful to abstract from those underlying causes because the world's a complicated place. Right. And the order that emerges in markets, which this Grand Central Station is sort of a market. It, it, it's mm -hmm. a funny kind of hybrid thing. But the order that emerges in what we normally call markets, that we can abstract from all the individual motivations of the buyers and sellers. Some people buying a good because they think it's socially attractive. Some buying it because it's really useful. Some buying it because they made a mistake. They read something that made them think they'd like it. That the order that emerges from those thousands of independent decisions that looks as if it was decreed. That, that price should move in these certain ways is a very powerful, powerful, powerful tool. And I, the Austrians, I assume, uh, would still accept that. Oh, yeah. I, I think that the now, – Let me phrase well, it a different – continue rambling and phrase it a different way. I think some people would suggest that supply and demand is an abstraction mm -hmm. of what determines prices uh, – is is a good thing. We teach. I teach my students. That I think you teach your students that. But it does abstract from all these these facts. Right. But what underlies those curves are these subjective perceptions of the opportunity that the individuals confront and the and the purposes and plans that they have. I think the operative phrase is of human action, but not of human design. So the overall pattern is not a, a function of any one design, but each individual has its purposes and plans that make it up. The classic example of this is a path in the snow. Popper used that. I want to get, I'm not, back in my days at Grove City College, uh, we weren't allowed to walk on the lawn. <laughs> it was outlawed. Okay. So as a result, you would be in the quad and it would be very cold out there, similar to Chicago in the winter, but we weren't allowed to create the path in the snow that would be the shorter path. But if we were, it wouldn't have been that any one student woke up at 7.30 a.m. in the morning and decided, you know what, I'm going to create a path in the snow. They would just try to get from building A to Correct. building D faster so they'd get out of the cold faster. But in the process of doing it, uh, student one, student two, student three, but we would be bad social scientists 
scientists if we didn't recognize the purposes and plans that the individual agents had, but then generated this overall pattern, right? And so I think that that's the, uh, the crucial issue in terms of understanding spontaneous order. The second, uh, it's of human action, but not of human design. This, it's not just that it happens, there's always per log, uh, purposes and plans, which is one of the reasons why freedom is so essential for spontaneous orders to come out, because freedom gives us the ability to pursue our purposes and plans as we see fit. The second point that I'd want to emphasize is about abstraction. All social sciences rely on abstraction. It is a mistake. A lot of people who are lay uh, people who get interested in Austrian economics criticize mainstream, what they call mainstream economics for this issue of abstraction. It's, un it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic and whatnot. This is all social sciences. We don't have a, a map of Fairfax City in our car that's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Right. The problem is adequate abstraction. We could have a map that just was a napkin that said northwest, east, you know, and, and south or whatever. And that, wouldn't, and that yeah. wouldn't help us very much. On the other hand, a, 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 a map that was too concrete would be too cumbersome for us to be able to even manage in our car. Mm -hmm. So we have to find the adequate level of abstraction. I think the Austrian criticism in the Martian example is to go at the issue of adequate abstraction. By abstracting so much from the human purposes and plans, we lose our understanding of why it is this phenomenon in the first place is taking place and, and what enables that phenomena to uh, be improved upon or by, by individuals within the system or whatnot. Let me give you an example on Milton Friedman, where he didn't necessarily follow his own methodology there. In the very uh, volume that he has, the essay on positive economics, he has a wonderful critique of Abba Lerner's uh, economics of control in there, in which he basically says Lerner's model is not going to work because it's economics as if it's in a vacuum. It doesn't pay enough attention to the institutional details, which will allow the bureaucracy and what incentives the bureaucracy might have in order to carry out the marginal pricing schemes that would be set up. In this case, Friedman is also engaged in the same kind of criticism yeah. that Hayek is engaged in, where he's saying, look, b because you're abstracting so much from the context of choice, you're going to end up by, in fact, misunderstanding what impacts that context of choice and therefore lead to bad public policy. And, I, I, you know, Milton Friedman, if you look at... Uh, and by, let me just put in yeah. Lerner's book, Lerner's article was uh, attempt to defend social centralized planning right. and, and government-mandated prices. Right. As marginal, a way of, the, the, the basic idea was that the government could set the price equal to marginal cost and then everything would, would be, be hunky-dory. Hunky yeah. yeah, but Friedman was saying that that's yeah. unrealistic. Right. And that, that criticism, which is in the flavor of the Austrian criticism, is that it's an art. Right. It, the level of abstraction, the level, level of realism is inherently an art, and when it's done well, it, it works, and when it's not done well, it doesn't work. I have a great story on this a few years ago. One of the other Austrian propositions I'm not going to talk about <laughs> here is, is capital theory, and I was involved in a debate at the AEA meetings, and Bob Solo was on the panel, and uh, he was involved in a debate between Cambridge and Cambridge back in the 1960s. Cambridge, which is England a, and Cambridge, Which is a very heated debate. And uh, the Austrians uh, were not part of that debate, but the Austrians believe that the capital structure is made up of um, heterogeneous – and, uh, goods, not necessarily flows of cash. A lot of times when you listen to the Chicagoans talk about capital, what they mean by it is flows of cash. And so as a result, the dollar is a dollar is a dollar. And so as a result, in Knight's uh, framework, there, it's not made up of all these particular goods and, and whatnot that have to be fitted together and coordinated over time. So the Austrians stress this issue of Home, uh, heterogeneity versus homogeneity of capital being a, a lump of right. K. Most modern economists treat capital as K, meaning K. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's dollars of stuff set aside today to produce stuff. a flow of money in the future. future. And so, so uh, I was talking about this, and uh, um, Solo interrupted me because he thought I was going to bring up Joan Robinson's critique or something, which I wasn't, but he turned and he said, he, he goes, listen, he goes, we never did damage to reality. 
hmm. you know, our models with K were, 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 an abst- were an adequate abstraction for and, what we and wanted to. Adequate. And adequate. You know, and he says, uh, and, and, you know, so we never did the damage of reality. Then when Solo had his own chance to give his own talk, he described himself as the world's leading expert on a too good world. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember thinking, <laughs> note to self, <laughs> this is damage to reality. This yeah. is damage to reality. <laughs> but of course, I was a young little punk and wasn't able to do that to no, Bob it, Solo. It, but it is a remarkable thing that, yeah. that we talk about K and L, capital and labor. Of course, right. we make the same abstraction with respect to labor, labor sometimes, right, right. as if human uh, inputs were all uh, could be could be all lumped together and as fungible. If, yeah, like one you know as if one move. you know one person rather than the idea of these particular skills and set. So I think that you know what uh, what we're getting at here in the subjectivism aspect is just that you have to pay respect to the idea that economic phenomena emanate in the first point, out of the choices of individuals, but what leads to those choices are people's perceptions of the opportunities on which they make their choices. Even if those it's, perceptions are wrong, they make their choices based on what right, they perceive. Right, so we can understand yeah. how they do that and how they learn, what feedback mechanisms. So you can see that that feeds in. The third proposition relates to that feedback mechanism, which I think is at the core of understanding why it is some spontaneous orders are benign and other spontaneous orders can turn rather, you know, uh, ugly at some sense. I mean, one of the things that we have to recognize is that the style of reasoning, invisible hand style of reasoning, can generate both the invisible hand but also the tragedy of the commons. Yeah, no, I, I, it's a very important thing. I yeah. think some people uh, misunderstand the power of freedom to think that laissez-faire is always good. Right. Uh, leaving things alone always leads to good outcomes because of this invisible hand comes into play. And of course... Depends on the rules. The, if the rules are not set right. correctly, the visible hand doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work very Adam, well. S- Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations has a discussion about why it is that the we can expect our dinner right from the 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 wonderful not out of benevolence but out of pursuit of self love of the butcher the baker and the brewer but he also explains why it is that because of their self love Oxford dons don't teach their students right which is and not a, which is an unattractive right, outcome of, and it's of, just it's a difference in the rules under which they're playing the economic game and I think that that puts an emphasis back on the institutions so in the market setting in which property rights are defined uh, prices are free to you know adjust and and uh, profit and loss accounting is accurate or rel- you know as best as as humans can do accurate accounting we tend to see the market as an entrepreneurial process of discovery and so when we see today's inefficiencies they generate reallocations of resources where profit opportunities are had by individuals who find better ways to adjust to these inefficiencies. And so we realize the constant gains from trade and the constant gains from innovation. So the market is this process of discovery, of entrepreneurial discovery, and, uh, and it's that focus on that story. So if you think about it in, in technical economics, we draw a supply and demand curve. When we uh, look at the exchange activities, a lot of times when we teach, we just go to the point of equilibrium. Right, and we say, look, there's a price it's and quantity be a, vector, a single that, price in the market, and, a, and, a, and an aggregate quantity, and that's going to persist unless something changes. Right. And the simplest way to understand what the Austrians are emphasizing when they emphasize this entrepreneurial thing is all the activity underneath the demand curve and above the supply curve that moves us to that. Uh, if no other changes happen, that unique vector which would clear the market. So the Austrians emphasize on the story before we get to equilibrium rather than just the equilibrium point. And I think that's an important um, aspect of – because first of all, there's no room for equilibrium uh, for entrepreneurship once you're at equilibrium because the entrepreneur has already done his job. Or to think about it back to what we were saying before, going all the way back to Menger, when you look at Valras, the way in which he had to work things out in order for his system of simultaneous equations to work out, he had to assume that all the, the exchange behavior took place before the, the auctioneer announces the price sure. vector. So it's pre-reconciliation of plans. Whereas the Austrians are much more like Adam Smith, who argued that it was about the higgling, you know, and bargaining in the market. Truck bargaining exchange. Right. And, and so um, – 
you know, to this point about institutions, just very quickly on on this, I, I tell all my students that humanity has two natural proclivities. We have a natural proclivity to truck, barter, and exchange, and we have a natural proclivity to rape, pillage, and plunder. Yeah. And the way in which we, we go in either one of those directions is a function of the institutional rules of the game in which we go in. If, we're, if the rules of the game are set up such that there's higher rates of return from rape, pillage, and plunder, we should, you know, we expect to see that. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, the the vast history of humanity is one in which that that tended to go uh, dominate. To dominate yeah. yeah, whereas the truck barter and exchange uh, requires the institutions of property and a rule of law and and, and and these kind of things. So I think this emphasis on the entrepreneurial market process. Think about your um, your podcast just uh, a week or so ago on the tyranny of the market. Um, of course, there are situations which the markets deviate from ideal perfectly competitive conditions. But that doesn't mean that ipso facto, that means markets have failed. What it does is when it deviates, it sets in motion a process by which entrepreneurs enter into the market and find the gaps and fill those gaps, provided they have freedom of entry and, uh, and, 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 you know, and the ability of the market price system to adjust over time. It's, um, it's a well, wonderful thing to see. Chicago economist Yale Brosen was an outstanding economist at understanding the dynamic nature of markets. Uh, you know, you taught in the business school for years there. And uh, Harold Demsetz and Al, this goes back before, their emphasis is not so much on the unique price quantity vector that clears, but on Some, the dynamic activity. Yeah, and no, I think that's a very important point, and we're, we're almost out of time. Oh, so that's okay. So I want to I bring us back maybe full circle. Modern economics, when it looks at those imperfections, um, most economists say, oh, therefore, we need to intervene to, to make things better. And I think the value of the Austrian approach is, in, in this particular point you're emphasizing about dynamism, it, is to recognize that it, does, it isn't static. It's right. not an equilibrium. It's not going to just sit there. Things are changing constantly, and you don't fully – you should try to fully understand where things are heading. Uh, and what's going to come next, and that that I think modern economics, because of its emphasis on the, the Newtonian physics, has lost that appreciation of the dynamism. It's lost that appreciation for the role of the entrepreneur. It's abstracted from the role of the entrepreneur and individuals in creating what we see in the world around us, which you could argue, well, that's so what? It's harmless. It's just so – it's so you don't really fully understand it. And this comes back to the Grand Central Station yeah. point. And sometimes you're right. Yeah, it, it yeah. Is, it, it, it's not important to understand it. But it is important in two senses. One, in, in the policy area, we often make terrible mistakes because we fail to recognize that dynamic nature. But the second is, is that we don't really appreciate the world around us the way we should. And I think an underappreciated uh, aspect of the Austrian school – is this this aspect of coordination the challenge is coordination that that mathematical economics solves with a wave of the hand mm -hmm. uh, but in the real world it gets solved in ways that are really quite what, yeah, what think, Hayek called a marvel I think that the the way to understand Hayek's career actually is from his dissertation onwards is that what he tried to do was he was trying to solve this problem of coordination under increasingly complex conditions. So the first problem he tackled as an economist was the one of imputation. How can you have production for an uncertain future? And how is it that prices over time, intertemporal prices, get set? That was his doctoral dissertation. Then, you know, you get the so, – so how is it that a car is being produced today or thought up or dreamed of that won't be consumed until 10 years from now? How is it that that system – that stream of production activities is coordinated mm -hmm. so that we don't have wildly, you know, crazy economic activity? And Hayek sought to try to explain that, the problem of intertemporal coordination. And then that led him to his theory of the problem with business cycles because that's when it can get derailed, right? Um, his understanding, as you pointed out, of the price system, of understanding when agents don't have the, the division, of no, division of labor entails with it a division of knowledge. So how can it be that these individuals who have no idea who it is that they're dealing with or why it is that they're dealing with them coordinate with one another so that we get the shoes that are on our feet? And as he talked about the, co the coordination mechanisms of the price system. We don't get persistent shortages and right. surpluses in random places. And so I think there's a great unity in Hayek because people then took that for granted and he said, no, 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 there's specific institutions. So you have to understand the rule of law, the rule of property, all these things, which led him into 
political theory. So it wasn't that he like gave up on economics. It was that he had to go into those things because so much of economics treats those institutions as given. And the socialists mid-century were denying the givenness of that, that he had to then bring that back again and say, wait a minute, guys, you can't get marginal cost pricing unless you have a private property regime because you're not going to get the exchange ratios and the feedback mechanism yeah. for when you learn. And so I think that you can see a unity in Hayek's ideas. And these are very relevant for us today. You mentioned Thomas Sowell. Soul's book, Soul takes one aspect of Hayek's thought and pushes it and makes us think very seriously about issues, um, you know, in, in law and economics and public policy. But it's also the case that we have a lot of young economists that are now coming up in the ranks um, that are going much further with Hayek's ideas, uh, I think, than, than any generation before. I mean, we have a, a, a young economist named Chris Coyne who has a book out with Stanford right now called After War. It's about the political economy of exporting democracy and markets in U.S.-led interventions, and he raises all kinds of difficulties associated with those efforts, including what we see in the Middle East today, but but prior to that in our other efforts to do it. And, and he shows how... Because they they uh, um, are unable to tap into the local knowledge and the various uh, necessity of certain institutions, you can't get the kind of constructivist efforts to plan democracy and markets the way that the government might think that it can. So, uh, you know, Coyne is, 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 is doing, you know, fascinating work in that regard in applied economics. Y- you mentioned earlier an issue about the Chicago school and the issue about mathematics and application. I sort of steered the wrong way in in one sense because I focused on the theory aspects. But the reality, the good point about the Chicago school was always that its focus was on application of economics to making sense of the world. One of my favorite comments is Gary Becker at the Fed conference that I was part of that honored Milton Friedman a few years ago. Becker described what Milton Friedman meant to him. And he said, Milton Friedman taught me that economics was more than just a game to be played by clever people. Yeah. It, instead, it was a tool for social understanding. I was thinking, you know, that was just amazing. And Friedman did stand for that. Yeah, I and, and, and I think that uh, a lot of times when – the way a lot of people understood that is to do statistical analysis. The, the way the Austrians have to understand that to me is that the purpose of theory – this is in Mises – the purpose of theory is to do history, is to do applied History, contemporary public policy is simply contemporary history. It's current histories. So, so the what, idea is to learn something other than just something that happened once. When you think about history, right. you think, of, oh, it's you know, so th- one damn are, thing after another. Right. But of course, we like to think that we could learn something right. from those theories. Sequences. Are eyeglasses and history is like reading. And so you have to have a certain set of eyeglasses on to be able to read the history the right yeah. way. And that's the point of what, what Mises is trying to get at. So the point wasn't to just do endless discussion of our eyeglasses. It was to put <laughs> eyeglasses on in order to do the applications. And so the contemporary Austrian school, the younger Austrian school, is doing a lot more uh, analysis of the real world now with these set of eyeglasses that have been given to them by not only Menger and Bombavrik and, and Mises and Hayek and Kurt and Rothbard and Lachman, but also combined with, you know, Alchin and Demsets and, and, and a whole coast and north and a whole stew of people, uh, you know, Buchanan, we can't forget Buchanan in this mix. And you put all of these people together and then you try to form a really cool set of eyeglasses, which questions not only the knowledge problem, but also the political process to understanding the world. And then you go forward and look at the world. And so works like coins on the, the war reconstruction issues and uh, works by people Peter Leeson on self-governance and um, and the way in which uh, individuals uh, sort of like his analysis in Somalia or, or, you know, work like that. Ben Powell has a wonderful discussion of the economic development in Ireland in recent years. I mean, these guys are doing really fantastic work in trying to examine real world questions through the lens of the Austrian school and these various different propositions. And I didn't get a chance to go through all ten of them, but some of them well, have very, yeah, very, yeah, very strong, very strong analytical positions having to do with capital, monetary theory, uh, you know, uh, legal institutions, whatnot that that the Austrians have as a theme. But the goal, I think, in the end of the day, 
would be you know, Milton Friedman's position, which is there's only good economics and bad economics. It just so happens that the good economics would have to take into account these propositions. Uh, and I think if we moved in that direction, then we would do more for the legacy of these ideas and their importance for understanding uh, the social world than any kind of uh, preoccupation with the name of a school or your doctrine. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a wonderful summary. Uh, we're out of time, but I have to ask you and, and quickly uh, give me three or four things that someone should read who wants to learn more about the Austrian school, and we'll put links to those up on the web. Some of them may be available on the web; others right. may just be. Um, uh, you know, books that they might want to explore and read. Can you give me a couple quick ideas? And if if you want to defer, we'll just put the links up afterwards. It's up to you. No, I can give you an answer. I teach my graduate course every spring, and I use four books as the core books. And those are um, Ludwig von Mises' Human Action, which is now out in a wonderful new edition through Liberty Fund, um, F.A. Hayek's Individualism and Economic Order, uh, Murray Rothbart's Man, Economy, and State, and uh, Israel Kirzner's Competition and Entrepreneurship. And I think those four books form the core of understanding the Austrian school, and then you have those, to read the more contemporary yeah, stuff. Now, those are daunting, uh, some of them quite large books, right. some of them very dry. Uh, can you recommend something shorter for a novice? I would recommend, for example, The Use of Knowledge in Society by Hayek. As a story right. It's not the easiest to read, but it is no. short. Um, I mean, obviously, that's a great reference. The Road to Serfdom is still a um, you know a fundamental uh, book that a lot, a lot of people can read with uh, great pleasure. Mises' book Liberalism is an extremely easy read and a, and a great read. Uh, Rothbart's Foreign New Liberty is is a is a very easy read. Uh, Israel Kirzner, uh, uh, mainly competition entrepreneurship, would be the easiest. Uh, read for individuals um, that that want to be uh, aware of his stuff. I do think some of these modern books that I mentioned are extremely important. I mean, Chris Coyne's After War um, is an outstanding book that will introduce uh, new audiences to Austrian economics, dealing with uh, a, a very important topic. As I I uh, describe the book as the the most important book on the most important topic of our age, which is, uh, that says a lot about a book and my endorsement yeah, it's of it. not faint praise. <laughs> and I think that um, uh, you can learn an awful lot about good economics by reading that book and then seeing it in the application to a very pressing issue, which everyone cares about, and it's available with Stanford, and uh, you can get it in an inexpensive paperback. And, yeah, we'll put a uh, link up to it on the, yeah. on the website. So I, I, I think that that book will tell you a lot about what's going on, and hopefully some of the books I've written uh, you know, over yeah, the we'll years. Yeah, we'll put some links up to those, too. <laughs> uh, Pete, Pete's not tooting his own horn, but we'll toot it for him on the website. Uh, Pete's a prolific writer, and both in essays and articles uh, and books, and we'll put links to some of them, not all of them, up on yeah. the web. And, of course, the essay that we used as the foundation for this conversation is – uh, concise Encyclopedia of Economics essay on the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, that book will be available soon. We'll put links up to that, of course, on the site as well. Pete, thanks for a fascinating conversation, and uh, we'll have you back soon. Okay, thank you very much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.